But I want to talk about the two ways to be faithful. And of course, when scripture offers us two ways, there's only real one, there's only really one way. There's only one way of, of Jesus here. The other way is never a true way. It's always a lie. As was told to you in my bio, I, I teach in the Institute of Spiritual Formation here. Although I find it's interesting, when I get students, very few of them know what spiritual formation means. Spiritual formation is simply learning obedience from the heart. It's learning to offer your whole self to God. And the difficulty is what most of us don't realize in our Christian life is we've actually learned how to be faithful in the flesh. We've actually tried to wield ourselves to try to construct a good Christian and it's killing us and it's warping our souls. We need a new way, which is in fact a very old way, a way of abiding. I worry that instead, when we choose the way of the flesh, again, most of this is not on purpose, this is just kind of what happens. The flesh is profoundly deceitful. But instead of learning obedience from the heart, we actually kind of just learn cliches. It's easier to live in the flesh for the glory of God and at the end just say, oh, for the glory of God. <laughs> and somehow think that magically makes it true. But to live for the glory of God means we have to receive his grace where it can be found. And in light of what we receive, we then overflow, or to use the passage from 2 Corinthians 3 and 4, we reflect back to him his glory. What you reflect back to him, you have first received from him. But again, this is where we have two ways before us. There are two ways to attempt to be faithful. One way is a faithfulness of the self. I notice people do this in one of two ways. If we try to be faithful in ourselves, we either try to be good and we reduce the Christian life down to what we call moralism. We think God has forgiven us, but now he just wants us to get our act together. So we thank him for the cross and we move on and we try to construct a life in our power. We try to fix ourselves. And this becomes, quite honestly, just a grand scheme of self-help. But I actually wonder if for many of you there's a different temptation. I wonder if your temptation is to hear grace and to trade it for something slightly different. This is what we would call trying to embrace cheap grace. A grace that doesn't demand a life at all. This is the kind of grace that thinks all God really wants is that you acknowledge his existence and then you can move on with your life. Both of these ways are an attempt to reconstruct a different God than the one we find in scripture. And then there's the way of Jesus. And the way of Jesus is always, always the way of truth. And it's always the way of the cross, which means the Lord will always be leading us into reality and he will not let you live in fantasy. One of the greatest temptations you have is that you're trying to trade reality for fantasy. That's what the flesh offers you. That's what the world offers you. It's fantasy. When Jesus talks about the kingdom, he's talking about the logic of reality, how the world works. The problem we have though, is we come to think that what this means is that Jesus is just gonna simply lead us into victory. And what Jesus is interested in is leading you to the cross. If you read scripture honestly from beginning to end, what you will discover is that God is always leading his people in such a way that he breaks the truth of them open before his eyes. In Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, we're told that a proper reading of scripture will awaken the thoughts and intentions of your heart and leave you naked before God. Most of us don't want the thoughts and intentions of our heart awoken. And that's what the word does, because that's what God does. In Luke 7, 47, we find Jesus in the home of a Pharisee. And a woman kind of breaks in in all sorts of kind of embarrassing sorts of ways. And the Pharisees don't know quite what to do with this. And of course, Jesus adores this woman. And in the midst of all that happens, Jesus says something profoundly interesting. 
He criticizes the Pharisees by saying, the one who is forgiven much can love much. The woman who burst in was a clear sinner. Everyone knew her sin. She kind of wore it on her sleeve. And Jesus holds her up because she knows how desperate she's in need of Jesus. Notice that Jesus claims that your ability to love is directly tied to how much you know you need forgiveness. He isn't saying, well, Pharisees, if only you would sin more, you could love more. That's not what that means. The Pharisees' problem is they had no idea what their sin entailed. They had no idea. This woman knew the very depths of her sinfulness, and because of that, she could love. The Christian life is learning to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. It is a path of love, and that means the road that the Lord has you on will increasingly be a road of of, of realizing how desperately you need forgiveness. In the entirety of Christian spirituality, we see the people that we talk about as saints all say the same thing. It's a very weird thing they say. Towards the end of their life, they look back on their life and say, you know, it feels like I was a better Christian when I was younger. (laughs) I was more zealous back then. I was more excited. But I knew very little about my sin. I didn't depend on God all that much. But now in their maturity, what they realize is when they were young, they thought the Christian life would be conquering sin and going to victory. And in their wisdom, they realize the Lord was showing them the truth of their hearts. The Lord was leading them to a place where they finally saw. Many of us have these sins we kind of look at. We're like, oh man, I just need to deal with this. Or, so I can't believe I still struggle with that. You have no idea the ocean of depravity that is in your soul. And yet that is the path the Lord wants to take you on. Because he wants to reveal the truth that his power is made perfect in your weakness, not your strength. He wants to show you that you do not define yourself. You discover yourself before the face of God. He wants to lead you so that you know his power precisely where you need it, which is your brokenness and your rebellion and your sin. This is why the two virtues other than love that are most prominent in the Christian life is humility and gratitude. You see, if you give yourself to the flesh and away of the flesh to try to to solve your problems, to try to fix your life, to try to be a good Christian, you won't be humble and you you won't be overflowing with gratitude. You won't be grateful. Because it will be something you've constructed. What the Lord offers you is something different and something much more profound. Listen to this parable that the Lord tells us about the person who prays. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes on all I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes up to heaven. But he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. There's two ways to try to be faithful. One seeks to manage God. It's the Pharisee who's looking in a mirror of his goodness, and he's saying, look, God, look at all I'm doing for you. Look how good I am. Look how much I've done. This is the older brother from the parable of the father with two sons. Look how many years I have served you, the older brother tells his father when he goes out to the field to pursue him. Jesus doesn't doubt what they said is true. (laughs) They have been faithful in these ways. But this Pharisee has no idea how desperately he needs God. The tax collector is a different sort of person. This person knows the truth. He is desperate for God. He throws himself on God's mercy by naming the truth. 
The call of the Christian life is a call to draw near. This is different because at the end of Exodus at Sinai, what we discover is that the call is don't draw near lest you die. What's astonishing is by the time you get to the book of Hebrews, now the call is very different. Not only is the call to draw near, the call is to boldly ascend to the throne of grace. Draw near. The problem is you're not able to draw near in any other manner than in the truth. And that's what so many of us struggle with. The lie of the flesh is that God either can't hear this or God simply won't hear it. That I can't bring the truth to God. He doesn't want to hear any of this. I find it interesting when I train my seminary students on how to pray honestly. You want to know what their their first response always is? This doesn't feel reverent enough. I appreciate they use the word feel because it does name an experience they're having. It has nothing to do with reality. (laughs) This doesn't feel reverent. And I always have to remind them the opposite of honesty is not lacking reverence, but dishonesty. And I think we can all assure ourselves that what God doesn't want us to be is dishonest in prayer. And yet, that is often how we try to draw near. Too many of us draw near to God in the same way we go on a first date. Oh, this old thing, I always wear stuff like this. This place, oh, I always eat out at places like this. You never lie more than when you go on a first date. You simply don't. We just call it putting our best foot forward. (laughs) It's really kind of lying if we're honest about it. And yet that is how often we see the Christian life. We put our best foot forward by pretending to be something we're not. If you want to destroy your prayer life, there's an easy way to do it. Pray like you imagine a good Christian should. That's praying in fantasy. It's rejecting reality. It's a refusal to pray the truth and to name the truth. God wants to name the truth of your hearts. He wants to open you to reality. He wants to meet you where you need him most. And so if you come in prayer or you draw near before him, and you come as your Christian avatar. And our Christian avatars are great prayers. They, all, they know all the fancy theological words to use. They stay awake when they pray. And if you project your avatar at God, God can do nothing for you there because you've never drawn near. I find it interesting that we have this deep sense of just what reverence looks like and what God can hear. You might not realize this, but there's another thing you do when you pray and when you draw near to God. Every one of you does this, and we we all do it. It's just very natural. You all assume you know how God receives you. We have this innate sense of how God receives you. I see this in my seminary students all the time. For many of my seminary students, you know what happens when they go to pray? God rolls his eyes at them. (sighs) Okay, fine. what, What do we have now? You're back again? Okay, what'd you do this time? And they have this sense that God is kind of annoyed with them when they come to pray. Many of my seminary students spend a lot of their time trying to figure out what what Christ's work on the cross did for them. And of course, that's the kind of thing we need to do. I'm a systematic theologian. I spend a lot of time thinking about the, the atonement. What did Christ do for us on the cross? But the funny thing is when they go into prayer, all of that gets thrown out the window. Most of my seminary students spend their prayer trying to atone for their sins. Many of them turn against themselves in prayer. They go to pray and then they realize they've woken up (laughs) and they were less praying than sleeping. Or many of them, their minds wander constantly and they're flooded with guilt, and the way they respond is by turning against themselves. And they become to be very harsh on themselves, because here's the fantasy. The fantasy is that God is a lightning bolt in hand, and he's looking at you as you pray. And the fantasy is maybe if I turn against myself, God will put it down. This is paganism, by the way. There's nothing Christian about this. 
This is a fantasy of a pagan world where you have these gods that are flying off the handle that maybe you're powerful enough as a person to manipulate them, to manage them, to get them on your side. You could do no such thing. There's only one way you could go with these things and it's God word. The Lord is leading you on a very clear path. It's the same path he's always led his people on. He wants to show you the truth. And when you draw near, and I'm gonna use prayer today as an example of this, but when you draw near to God, what happens to you is your heart opens and it shows you what the treasures of your heart are. When God delivered Israel from Egypt, he led them to wander in the wilderness. In Deuteronomy 8, 2, we're given a hint of why he did this. He tells us there that the reason he made them wander was to show them what was in their hearts. Israel needed to see that what was in their heart was complaining, was bitterness, was anger, was a desire to go back to Egypt, to the land of slavery and the world and the flesh. And of course, this is exactly what they did when the true God of glory descended with fire and fury at Sinai, Israel responds by trying to use Egyptian worship technology, a golden calf, not to worship different gods, but to control the scary God on the mountain. How often are we tempted towards idolatry that gives us a technique, that gives us a methodology, that gives us a way to tether God to ourselves so we can get the God we want rather than the God who is. That simply isn't the God we have, and that's not what he's interested in. I could tell you for certain what the Lord is doing in your life. Scripture does not hide it. The Lord is leading you into your weakness, and he's exposing all the ways you want to reject that. And the Lord is seeking to lead you along a path to show you what is in your heart, whatever is in your heart. And he wants you to bring that to him. If you realize you don't want to pray, that is precisely what you should tell God. If you don't, you are simply sending your Christian avatar to pray and you're praying dishonestly. Why I wanna focus on prayer is because prayer is this really interesting instance. It's your whole Christian life miniaturized. Every temptation you have as a Christian is gonna show up in your prayer life. How you struggle with sin, or how you've just chosen no longer to struggle with sin will show up in prayer. Prayer is an act of drawing near to God in light of how he's given himself to you. And so how you give yourself to him in response will show you, have you believed it? If you don't draw near honestly, I wonder if you sat long enough at the cross. I wonder if you've really realized what the Lord has done. I was, I mentioned yesterday, I was a a biblical studies major at a smaller Christian university and I was an RA and and of course the the benefit of being an RA is I had my own room, um, which was golden. I needed my own room very badly. And one evening I was praying and I was was reading my Bible and I was praying and I had a, a realization, this kind of revelation. And I realized as I grew in knowledge, which was, I was growing exponentially in knowledge in, 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 at, at, as an undergrad. Simultaneously, my prayer life was plummeting. The more I seemed to know, the less I seemed to pray. And as I sat there in my dorm room alone, I realized I don't believe in prayer because I don't really pray. Yeah, I'll pray before a meal. Yeah, I'll pray for someone if they ask but I don't just come before the Lord. And what would it mean to proclaim that the Lord of the universe attends to me, brings me into his presence, sets his gaze upon me, and just be like, yeah, I just don't have time. It simply means I don't believe it. I was so struck with this. I was so embarrassed by it. I was so ashamed. I immediately went down the hall to my my friend, Jeff, who's an RA, and now a pastor in Chicago. And I said, Jeff, I need to just confess something. This was unusual for me. I didn't usually do this. Jeff, I, I just need to confess a sin to you. He's like, okay, <laughs> what is it? I'm like, I, I don't believe in prayer. I never pray. And I was expecting, I'm not sure what I was expecting. I don't know, rebuke? I don't know, kindness? I'm not sure what I was looking for. What I wasn't expecting is what he said. This fellow Bible major, future pastor. Yeah, I don't pray either. <sighs> You're useless. Okay, we gotta go to the other. So we went to the other end of the hall. Our friend Nate. 
Nate, we have to confess something to you. I kid you not, a half an hour later, we were 12 deep. And there was an epidemic of prayerlessness at a Christian university. Most of you don't realize how dangerous this place can be for you. How easy it is to be a Christian here. How easy it is to forget that we live in the present evil age. How desperately we are in need of Jesus. See, the, there was something good about my instinct to confess that sin. But you know what I didn't do when I realized I didn't believe in prayer? I didn't tell God. <laughs> Ironically, I didn't pray about it, <laughs> which was fitting, I suppose. I thought another friend of mine could hear something that I didn't think God could hear. I didn't realize it at the time, but I bought into one of the great lies of the flesh when it comes to your prayer life. It was something my mentor later when I came to Talbot, who's my great colleague here now, John Coe, taught me as a student. I remember the day he taught it to me when he looked at me and said, Kyle, <laughs> prayer's not a place to be good. It's a place to be honest. Stop trying to be good at prayer. <laughs> you see, I had turned it into a performance. I had turned it into a thing that I was supposed to be good at and so I never heard the good news of prayer. And I worry that you don't know the good news of prayer. I worry that when you hear prayer, you think it's probably the same as all religions. Oh, doesn't everyone pray? It's just kind of a thing religious people do. Christian prayer is utterly different than anything else on offer. And let me explain why. Because when God looks at you, you know what he thinks? We're told what he thinks. He thinks, wow, you have no idea how to pray. And that's good news. God has very low expectations for you in prayer. We're told this in Romans 8, 26. The Spirit prays for our weakness, for you don't know how to pray as you ought. The Word of God tells you. He knows you don't know how to pray. What has He done about it? He sends His Spirit into your soul to pray for you. It's not only that He took his sins, your sins upon Himself and died for you. He looks at you. He knows you don't know how to pray. And so He descends into your soul and we're told the spirit groans with groanings too deep for words. Not only does he pray for you, but he so experiences the depth of your sin, the depth of your brokenness, the depth of your anxiety, the depths of your worry, that all he does is groan to the Father. In Romans 8, this is in comparison with the creation. The world groans because it knows what it was created for, and it groans because it knows that's not what it is right now. So too the spirit in your soul knows what you were created for. It knows the glory you have in Christ Jesus. And so the spirit groans. But the Lord doesn't stop there. We're told that you have a great high priest, Jesus, who's been tempted in every way as you are, but without sin. This high priest hasn't merely gone into the temple. He's ascended into heaven. He's gone beyond the veil and he's an anchor of your soul in the presence of God and he always lives to intercede for you. Before you utter a word in prayer, before you close your eyes and stop your mind wandering, before you kind of try not to fall asleep, prayer is already happening. The good news of prayer is it's not something we create. We don't generate prayer. We don't come up with prayer. It's not a mere performance. You enter prayer. The good news of prayer is before you say a word, the Son and the Spirit have said every single word necessary. But here's the image that comes to my mind. Imagine God hears your prayers in stereo sound. So there's like a right and a left channel that God's hearing. In one channel, God hears the groanings of the Spirit. Blah, something like that. That's the Spirit praying from your soul. That's what the experience of you is like, evidently. And in the other ear, God hears your prayers. I wonder how dissonant that sound is. The Spirit only prays for you in reality and never in fantasy. 
The spirit names the truth. The truth of your boredom, the truth of your rebellion, the truth of your lack of interest, the truth of your lust, the truth of your addiction, all of it. What would it sound like to God against the backdrop of the spirit's groans if then you pipe in? Hey God, things are going well. Got some things I need to fix, but we're doing all right. I worry that many of us have learned to pray in the name of Jesus and we think that's simply a way to end our prayers. If you can't name the truth in prayers, it tells you that you're actually praying still in your own name. It's fortunate for us that your name doesn't get you access to God. The name of another does. To pray in the name of Jesus is to boldly ascend to the throne of grace because he's achieved all that is necessary to do so. If you don't feel worthy, praise God. Praise him that you don't come in your worth. Praise him you don't come in your goodness. Praise him you don't come because some of you figured the Christian life out. Praise him because you come in his name and not your own. If your mind wanders in prayer, like so many of ours does, Notice already, because of the Son and the Spirit's prayer for you, this is a gift to you. It's not a sign that you're bad at prayer, and even if it is a sign that you're bad at prayer, guess what? God already knows that and isn't surprised by it. He's told you already, wow, you're bad at prayer. I'm going to give you my spirit. But if your mind wanders and your solution is to turn inward, to turn to yourself, to try to give yourself a pep talk, to try to self, I'll be better, God. And so now you're just lying to him because you won't. If you wake up in prayer and feel bad about yourself and you try to, I don't know, take a five-hour energy or you try to kind of get yourself going to try to stay awake, to show God you're serious, you're lying. You're lying to him and you're lying to yourself. When you come into God's presence, and this has always been true, when you come into God's presence, the truth of your heart opens. When your mind wanders, it's your heart showing you what you care more about than God. And it's God offering you a gift. Let's talk about this. Whatever your mind wanders to, it's the Lord's gift to you to show you the truth. Because the Lord leads you to show you what is in your heart. Can you bring the truth to him? You know what I do in prayer? I write a lot. They mentioned I write books. I'm I'm from a family of writers. Everyone in my family writes. It's just something we do. I noticed that when my mind wandered in prayer, I had outlined an entire book. (laughs) So really I was just outlining a book in prayer in the presence of God rather than actually offering myself to God. And I sat back with the Lord and I said, Lord, what is going on here with me? Like, why did I turn to this? And you know what became clear to me? When you come in prayer, you stand before the whirlwind. You stand before the God that you can't get your tethers in. The God who's utterly free. And what my heart does in his presence is it turns to things that make me feel like I'm in control of my life. My heart wants a mirror to look in that says, we're doing all right, it's gonna be okay. And the mirror the Lord gives me is the truth that always leads me through the loss of my life in order to find it. And in my flesh, I still would rather find a way that makes myself simply feel better. What does the Lord open in your heart when you pray? And does that lead you to yourself to manage God and to manage your life? Or does that lead you to him? Can you offer the truth and say, Lord, here, this is yours. There's a modern writer on prayer who has a great example of prayer when he says, you know, I imagine on the Titanic, when the Titanic was sinking, no one had a problem with their mind wandering when they prayed. And I imagine that's true. Because when you're looking at your imminent death, you're finally praying the deepest desires of your heart. See, for most of you, when you fall asleep in prayer, it's actually a sign to you that you're falling asleep because you're not praying the things you actually want to pray for. You're praying like you imagined a good Christian should pray like, (laughs) which of course just isn't true. 
And instead of actually offering the deepest desires, the deepest longings, the deepest worries, your deepest fears, your, your, your most primal anxieties, you offer what you think God wants you to say, what you think God wants to hear. You've probably never prayed the Psalms <laughs> if you pray this way. Because the funny thing about the Psalter is it teaches us what God is like by revealing to us what God can hear. Only, only our God would put a book like the Psalms in the scriptures, <laughs> which is a book of people complaining about God. <laughs> My favorite comment from Psalm 44 is when the psalmist demands to know if God's fallen asleep on the job. Have you ever prayed that? That's a great prayer. I've wondered during this epidemic if God hadn't fallen asleep. God, what are you doing? Are you even there? What is happening? They name the truth because God not only sees the truth in you, he has prayed the truth. His spirit has already from the depth of your soul declared what is true. We have to come to God in truth. There is no other way to come to God. Any other way is simply fantasy. And again, we're confronted with Matthew 7. Remember in Matthew 7, there's someone standing before the judgment seat of God. And instead of offering themselves in truth, they give God their ministry resume. Lord, I've done wonderful things. I've healed people. I've done wonderful works. And God says, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. I do not know you. God doesn't deny that they've done miracles and healed people. So this is a person with a pretty impressive ministry, we might say, who does not know Jesus. They never offered themselves in truth to him. They never drew near. You are called to draw near. Prayer is not a place to be good. It's a place to be made known. Prayer is a place to bring all that God sees and offer it to him in truth. In prayer, we follow the spirit down into the depths of our soul where God himself has gone and we follow his groaning so we offer ourselves in love. The path to grow in love is the path to know how much you need forgiveness. Just think about that. What would it look like for the Lord to bring you along a path where you're increasingly realizing how much you need him? And does that have anything to do with your expectations? I worry that so many of us just have false expectations of, the, of what the Christian life will be like. That when the Lord leads us, we simply go, no, no, Lord, this is the wrong path. <laughs> this, is not, this is not the way we go. We don't go the road to the cross. We go to the road to victory. We need to win. We need to dominate. We need to get me strength. And the Lord says, no, that's not where I am. I'm found in your weakness. I'm found in your dependence. I'm found in your longings. The second thing my seminary students worry about when they begin to pray the truth, they worry about reverence, but then they worry that this means we're taking sin lightly. You see, for them, they really want to take sin seriously and it's, it feels like such a burden. It's so serious that they don't think God can handle it. But notice what they've actually done. It's not that they're taking sin seriously. It's that they're not taking the cross seriously. In fact, they're taking sin more seriously than the cross of Christ. Jesus isn't afraid of your sin. He didn't die for you in your goodness. He died for you in your sin. He's not afraid of it now. There simply is no other you than the truth of who you are. Whatever that means, the truth of your anger, the truth of your fears, the truth of your worries, the truth of your anxieties, there is only the reality of your life that you can bring to God. If you're still thinking that what God really wants you to do is get your act together and find strength somewhere, you'll simply never be able to hear the good news about what the Lord has done for you. Because that's simply not what we find in scripture. He is leading you somewhere else. He is leading you to himself so that you know the truth. If your, your view of prayer will be that I come to pray 
and suddenly the kind of Shekinah glory descends and my face like Moses's begins to glow. What you'll often discover is that's actually not what prayer is like. Because again, if God gave you that, you would never look at the truth. John Owen, one of the stodgiest of the old Puritans. I love my stodgy Puritans. John Owen is considered the greatest Puritan theologian. And he's reflecting on this. And he says something pretty provocative here. He imagines a scenario where someone's praying and they're simply holding their life before the Lord. Say, Lord, take this sin away from me. Lord, take this sin away from me. Lord, take this sin away from me. Have you ever prayed this way? Lord, just make it go away. And God looks at this person, according to Owen, and he says, if I took this sin away from you, you would never come to me again. I wonder how many of us, when we feel life's going well, we simply stop praying. And it's only when things are going badly that we really realize we need to throw ourselves in the mercy of God. If God is leading you to abiding, if God is leading you to himself, then sin now, because of the cross, is an opportunity to embrace the truth. This is not taking sin lightly, but it's naming sin as sin and recognizing what has happened to sin in light of the cross. That we can boldly ascend to the throne of grace because Christ has already handled these things for us. We could boldly ascend because we pray in his name and not our own. But I still worry. I worry we have the false expectations of this. I think of 1 John 3, 19 and 20. This is an interesting passage because it's talking about someone who is before God. So someone here is drawn near to God. They're in his presence. And you know what John tells us happens to them? Their heart condemns them. (laughs) John thinks that for many of us, we're going to experience condemnation because we've drawn near to God. Again, I wonder if you have this kind of God. Do you have a God who may give you a thorn of the flesh to keep you humble? Do you have a God that when you draw near to his presence, your experience might be condemnation? Because that's what scripture proclaims is true. But notice what John says. He says it's your heart that's condemning you, not God. So if you experience condemnation, what you can never do with your experiences is just project them on God and say, God, why are you condemning me here? God isn't. But then John simply says, God is greater than your hearts and he knows everything. God is greater and he knows. Whatever you experience in prayer, this is an opportunity to offer your life to God. When you go to pray, do you feel totally alone? Do you feel your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling? Tell God, Lord, I think you're... I don't even know where you are. (laughs) Do you wonder why God doesn't seem to show up at times? But bear in mind when God does show up, sometimes it means your heart's condemning you and you're having a thorn of the flesh. (laughs) So showing up is, is, is much harder to interpret than we normally think. Can you pray the truth? See, the Christian life is always a drawing near. This has always been true. This was true in Eden. It's true of the tabernacle. It's true of the temple. It's certainly true that now that we are the new tabernacle of God, the dwelling place of God by the Spirit, the call is to draw near. The command throughout the book of Hebrews is draw near, draw near, draw near. You can draw near because of what Christ has done, but you can only draw near in the truth. When Paul in Colossians 4.2 talks about prayer, he says we need to be watchful when we pray. What does your heart do in the presence of God? Does it fall asleep? Is your heart full of lustful thoughts, of greed, of frustration, of annoyance? What happens in the presence of God shows you the truth. God is laying a path before you He says, this is how you follow me. Just like he did on the road to the cross when he asked the two disciples, what are you guys talking about? And they had to admit, we're talking about which one of us is the greatest. That becomes their path now to know the truth of how much they need forgiveness. Your call is to be powerful as a Christian. 
because your, your call is to so fully absorb the life of God that is given to you that you overflow in love of God and love of neighbor. The path by which you receive that, the path by which you receive the glory of God that it leads from glory to glory is a path of increasingly recognizing how much you need forgiveness. 30 years from now, you know what we will say? If you keep growing, 30 years from now, you're going to look back to your time at Biola and you're going to say, I had no idea how deep this sin went. I had no idea what was driving my porn addiction. I had no idea what was driving my narcissism. I didn't even know it was narcissism. (laughs) I had no idea why I was so full of pride. But what will expose you to the truth is God's presence. If you're uninterested in seeing the truth, you will be uninterested in coming into the presence of God. God always leads you into the truth. There simply is no other way to come to him. Biola, bless you as you finish this Tory conference. Use this time to carve out a space to simply offer yourself to the Lord in truth. Even if your prayer is a prayer that I've prayed throughout my life, Lord, I did not sign up for this. That is a profoundly honest prayer. Whatever you experience here, use it as an opportunity to draw near in the truth. Because you're surrounded with believers here and there's a great temptation for that to actually shut the truth down. Because as you look at others, your experience of them might actually awaken guilt and shame in you. And you might begin to wonder, am I the only one that wrestles with this? (laughs) And instead of coming to God with the truth, you might just turn inward and try to fix your life. Go to the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we want to take you up on your call to boldly ascend in the name of Jesus. Lord, you know and you see every thought, every temptation, every worry, every anxiety, every fear. Lord, you know the ways that we're actually sowing to the flesh and in our fantasy lives thinking we can still reap in the spirit. Lord, you see how we make decisions that are primarily based on a view of being human that's constructed on strength for the sake of control rather than knowing your power and weakness for the sake of love. Father, for many of us, prayer has become a time to try to manage you. We become like Adam in the garden who tries and wheels and deals with you, blaming Eve, trying to get out from under your, your, your glare Lord, have mercy. Lord, as you open our hearts to you, Lord, may we see the truth, may we name the truth, and may we grasp evermore onto Christ. He is our good. He is our hope. He is our life. And Lord, we do come to you in his name and not our own. In the name of Jesus, amen. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.